Okay, so my name is Clint Miller, K0GR. I'm from Ames, and uh, I've given this presentation a number of times over the years. And Tim asked me to pop in here and see if anybody was interested in this. So I updated it again this week oh. to uh, include uh, inflation is the name of the update. <laughs> uh, some jumps in prices. So fox hunting. This is not what we do, but no, it still looks kind of fun. Um, so it's, uh, it's a hidden transmitter hunt. Uh, and so sometimes you'll hear it called RDF, or radio direction finding. And uh, you'll hear some people call it transmitter hunt, uh, bunny chasing, tea hunting. They're all kind of names that get thrown around. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take several bearings and where those bearings cross and triangulate, um, that's uh, usually where you're trying to lo find the location. Um, and so it's usually time when you do a hunt, so sometimes speed matters. Um, it's a, no license is needed, so it's receive only, so it's good to do with scouts. Uh, it's good to kind of, you know, somebody's ham curious, it's a good activity to sort of show them what we can do. Um, a lot of times we're talking on the, another frequency to uh, give hints, so sometimes the license is helpful. Um, so uh, we, we encourage people to learn new skills, that's why we want to do it. Um, and it's good to find uh, interference, transmitters, um, you know, you may have to find somebody in distress. Not so much in Iowa, but, uh, you know, mountain ranges, that would be more of a practical place. Um, and then, you know, you can help out looking for down air aircraft with an ELP. Um, it's also an excuse to just build something. People want to build kits and, you know, so it's an excuse to just get in there and kind of build something that's not super technical, so it's a good gateway. Um, we find that every hunt is a new mystery, so if you kind of are interested in that, um, you know, that challenge, then, you know, where is it is a new hunt every time. Um, and then it's just fun. I just enjoy it. So, um, our basics are that somebody hides a two meter FM transmitter. That's how we do it. Um, it's a repeating tone, or you can have them, like, do a voice sequence. Um, there's an on-off timing, and you can vary depending on how your group, on how difficult you want to make it. Um, and sometimes the hider is the fox. So, so it's just somebody sitting in a vehicle with a radio and they're talking into the mic. So you have to find them to find the fox. The way we typically do it is we have a box that we hide. Um, and so most people use a directional antenna, but you can use other methods. Um, and so you take directional readings from several locations, you triangulate the bearings, and then you home in and try to take more readings. So you try to get closer to the area and, and find out where the bearings cross, you know. Um, and typically what we do is the hunt continues until everyone finds it or we run out of time. We tend to put a guardrails on it because some people will be out there for, you know, two days. <laughs> and they're determined to find it. And so, do we need to bring in food and water? Well, yeah, I mean, it gets pretty boring. So then you're looking for them instead of looking for the fox. And, yeah, so this is kind of a basic hunt that we did. Uh, just put this on here to kind of show what, what a hunt might be. And so we tend to start uh, at Hyvie Gas in Ames. And, Please mute your phones. That's my mom. <laughs> yeah, I told her I was doing a presentation today, so she probably figured she'd wait till I was started. <laughs> uh, so we yeah, we start kind of in the middle of town, and, and instead of doing like a shotgun start, we all start in one place. That way, we kind of know who's hunting and who we need to wait for. Um, and the first bearing I got that day was kind of almost due south, so I thought, okay, it's on the south side of Ames. So I. Uh, you know, instead of trying to go down Duff, I went a little bit towards campus and took another bearing. Um, the idea being that if you just run down that line, you're not going to get any crossing. So you don't know how far it is down that line. So the idea, usually when you start, is you want to kind of go the uh, perpendicular to your first reading and sort of get some crossing bearings. And so that's what I was trying to do here. Um, you know, I got over by the stadium and took a bearing, and I'm like, oh, okay, it's definitely south of Highway 30. You know, that's the direction I'm getting. It's got to be down south of Highway 30. So I went a little south of, uh, of the stadium there, you know, kind of by Ryman Gardens, and all of a sudden I got this cross. You know, I finally got a good angle on it, because it was every three minutes I was stopping, and so I wasn't really getting far enough uh, perpendicular to my first few readings to really get a good cross. And so when I got over here, I got a good strong bearing back this way. Um, so I went on this side, got another one across, and so it's like, okay, it's in here somewhere. And uh, lo and behold, it was right there uh, behind the vet school. So um, that's kind of an example of a, a pretty quick hunt that we did. Um, it didn't take me very many. There's a few more shots probably in there. What's your time on that hunt? Uh, I think it took me 20 minutes on a 
three or four minute cycle. One minute on and three minutes off, I think, is what we've run it in. But he doesn't count. It would take me like an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've done this a number of times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, the fox hunting's cousin is ADRF. And so you'll see this a lot, and this is kind of what's, what makes the, the, the press releases, and you'll see articles on it. Um, it's an on-foot sport. Uh, it's international. It's more of a compass and map exercise with some radio involved. Um, everybody starts at one end of a forest and moves to another end. Um, it's kind of like orienteering. Uh, they give you a map, and you have to figure out where you're going in the, co in the course and, and work on terrain. Um, and so, yeah, these guys are kind of crazy, and they're running through the woods and, you know, having fun doing this stuff. Um, so they've had a world championship. Um, they typically run five transmitters on one-minute cycles, and they're all on the same frequency. And they're given different dits, you know. So they're, they're going M, M O E I S H and 5 for the number of dits. And so you have to count the dits to know which fox you're hunting, and you have to plot all of them. Um, and there's like a punch card. And so these guys are serious about it. Um, so here's the, the quarantine area. They won't let you, they have them all fired up and running, but they won't let you hunt yet. So they have to quarantine everybody's equipment. <laughs> and you notice there's a lot of antenna tape yeah. measures in there. That's kind of the given tool a lot of people are running. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting endeavor because you have to make sure that you're you're going through the woods in the proper order and that you're not going down the hill and back up when you could have taken the trail around it would have been easier and faster and hit another fox on the way and so there's a there's the perfect order to do them in so it's an interesting excursion i've never done it but um so foxes for two meters um the the, the actual hidden transmitter part um old school is just somebody with an ht and i know the cyclone club on campus in ames does this they didn't have a fox, they just send somebody out and sit on a park bench with a radio. And that's how they do their hunts initially. Um, and, uh, you know, there's continuous ones where you can basically just, uh, you know, hook it up to a 3D, uh, you know, uh, player and plug it into the mic of a radio and put a rubber band on it and set it out and just let it run. And people can just transit, you know, uh, you might have a timeout timer issue, so then you can use like Vox and do some stuff there. Um, you know the microcontroller option um, and so you know there's several different ways to get this to happen so you have a signal on the air um, there's some all-in-ones so I'll talk about all of these as options so this is the fox that's back here on the table in the green box this is the one we typically hunt um, it's an old ICOM 02AT handheld um, and we typically run it in low power so about one watt um, and you know I probably should have brought for the small room an attenuator to put on it for my demo. It might be a little tough to get a demo going in here, but we'll do our best. Um, and then it's just got a silicon acid battery, and then I run a, this is the old picture, this is the Tiny Track 3 Plus with a different chip in it. Um, and now I'm running a PitCon. Um, so uh, this is the original Fox we used to hunt, made by W0DP, and it actually had like a PIC chip that he programmed for his, but similar setup battery and a radio. Um, so you can kind of build your own. Here's some kind of kits that are out there. They probably can't buy it necessarily a kit anymore, but you can find the schematics if you wanted to use that and part your own out. Uh, there's a few things out there, um, you know, based off of picks and things. Um, so this is what I'm running now. It's a PickCon by Bionics. You'll hear me say Bionics a lot because they kind of have the market on uh, a lot of these uh, devices. Um, so I don't think they have a kit, and the price is up to $69 for the, the pre-built. Um, the nice thing about this is it's got a little bit of a cheesy receiver, and so I could you program it over the air. Um, and so I was just reprogramming it this morning to uh, get it to accept um, uh, different timing. Because I had it set last night to almost continuous when I was messing around with it. So um, the new version is, you could, there's a little, you can open it up and plug a, like a uh, TRS plug into it and program it that way also. Um, they make a Baofeng version. You basically bolt it right on the back of your bow fang, and oh, Tim's got that. Idea, yeah. And uh, it's the same schematic, essentially, just different form factor. I've never handled one. I don't know if you paid the 63 bucks for yours that it's up to now. Yeah, I don't think it was quite that Yeah, much. they've been jumping in price. They're, they're slick. Uh, it's designed to run right off the, you've got to have the extended life battery for your bow because mm -hmm. it's got a jack on it for power out. Oh. My, my little jumper off that board was bad, yeah. so I just put a 
I just got a little RC connector on. I'm actually running the controller off of a mm -hmm. separate battery, and then I run the radio yeah. on that. Yeah, and he's got a, he's got a, a, an instruction sheet. If you need to hack into the actual radio and connect directly to the radio yep. instead of the battery. Yep. Yep. Yeah, their customer yeah. service was awesome. Yeah, and yeah, I bought on He was fantastic. Yeah, I bought a lot of APRS stuff from him. So yeah, it's good. Um, let's see, uh, Microfox is something they sell. It's this little uh, adjustable from uh, 0.05 milliwatts to 50 milliwatts. It's got a little lipo battery, and it's 100 bucks. And so this would be good for an on the on foot hunt in a park. Um, it's not going to have enough power. You get a mile away, and you're not going to hear it. And so we run into that problem a lot with our hunts. Is that if it's across town, you can't hear it, and you're driving around town with just your mobile antenna trying to hear the thing to even know what side of town it's on before you can start. So uh, this would be a real challenge to do you're something like that. that. You're in your vehicle with your vehicle mounted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. With the, yeah. Usually that's you know Story it's point. it's hitting this whether the vehicle mounted antenna hears it better versus your like HT with a with a directional antenna. Yep. It just depends on your setup, but. Um, so then, uh, you know, here's another version where it's just a single transmitter power. Um, it, uh, this one has DTMF tones, like mine, so you can turn it on remotely is the real benefit of the DTMF. We used to have to turn it on, or we'd say, okay, we're going to start the hunt. Somebody would drive to it, jump out, run over there, and flip the switch on it. So now that we have a DTMF, it's like, okay, is everybody ready? And I hit go, and uh, it works pretty slick. Um, that one for the bell tangle. Yeah, well. yeah, right. Why not? So uh, that works good. This is just the same thing, only a little higher transmitter, and it's got you put batteries in it. Um, so that's another one they sell. Um, so those are some kind of transmitter options you can get for hunting. Um, we've really been talking about <clears throat> trying to build a 50 watt and really have a challenge <laughs> because I've hunted a 75 watt repeater stuck transmitter on top of uh, the financial center in downtown Des Moines, and it was a bear to hunt that down. The FCC spent three days in Des Moines and couldn't find it. And we finally found it on top of the financial center. So that was a challenge. Um, all the urban clutter, 70 watts, you could hear it from Ames. You know, it was, it was a big, big deal to get that done. Um, okay, so uh, basic hunting equipment. You can use an HT or a scanner to hunt, and I have um, Melissa uh, Neeson will hunt just with her Baofeng body block, and she can find the fox. She's good at it. Her husband tries it, he can't make it work. Mm. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's kind of what you get used to, um, but, you know, if the rubber ducky, the body block method works, uh, there's some loops, you can get double, double antenna homing sets, I'm gonna go through all of these, uh, the quads, yagis, tape measure yagis, those are all pieces of antennas that you can use to hunt. Um, and then we need to talk about attenuators because that's pretty important. So, have you have you looked into the TDOA that's on Bionics? Uh, um, he doesn't sell it. He doesn't. It's still it's still like a the code and everything and the, and the right. schematic is there. I'm trying to build right, right now. Yeah. Just to see how it works. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting concept. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, body block or shield is basically the idea being that if the if the radio is on your chest and the signal's behind you, your body is blocking a lot of the signal. So as you have your back to the signal, it goes quiet. And as you turn to about you know 90 degrees, you'll start picking it up, and then you'll pick it up over here. So you essentially you're kind of working the knolls almost to figure out what direction it is. So that's kind of the concept with body block. We sort of theorize if you put a piece of aluminum chest plate on. Would it work even better, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to build some sort of suit of arms? <laughs> well, yeah, tinfoil chest piece. Um, and uh, yeah, you spin around. Um, so it, it works pretty well for that intermediate distance. Real far out, you don't have enough gain. You probably are struggling to hear it. You might hear it on your mobile in your car and get you to the right part of town. And then you can start doing this. When you get close in, we'll talk about attenuation. Um, so. You know, when you get to it's strong, you can start tuning off frequency. You're still in the receiver's pass band, but you're not getting quite as much of the signal, so it gives you a little more directivity. Um, you know, you, if you have a dual band, you can start hunting uh, on the, the, the 70 centimeter third harmonic. Basically, you just take the frequency and multiply it by three, and you happen to end up about in the 70 centimeter band, and you program that in your radio, and then you're getting a fraction of the full signal, but you can still do some directivity. And these techniques work on other equipment, too not just the body block method. So, um, 
you know, you can disconnect the rubber duck and that'll knock it down even more. Um, we had a, the, one of the guys that won a fox hunt was a Civil Air Patrol cadet. He grew up through that. He won with a handheld and a pocket knife stuck into the antenna jack. And he knew how to hold it to get the right amount of signal. And he was body blocking. And he, was, he beat everybody else in the club for that one. So he knew what he was doing with a lot of practice. Um, so uh, if you start hearing the thing with this antenna off, it's because of case leakage. Basically, the signal is going through the body of the radio and into the radio itself. You don't need an antenna to hear it because you're that close. And so that's sort of a hot cold indicator that you know you're close when you're hearing it without an antenna on your radio. Um, and so, you know, we've kind of theorized you could wrap um, foil around the radio and, and sort of cut down on that case leakage part. So, excuse me. Um, now that's the aluminum foil thing. Just watch out, you know, um, make sure you have diodes in your battery or put some tape over them. Um, so, um, <clears throat> body block, the null is kind of narrow. Um, basically, it's just when it's directly behind you, you're going to null it. Otherwise, you kind of hear it about 270 degrees. So you got to factor that in. Um, you know, stay away from other metal things because you're going to get some uh, some reflections and multipath. And there's I've been on a hunt. I swore it was in the ISU power plant, <laughs> and it was because the signal was reflecting off the big metal surfaces in there, and it was giving me some false readings. So. Um, okay, so receiving loop antennas. Essentially, these are typically a little small thing you put on top of the radio and you turn the radio, and they're very directional. They have a really strong null. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's not going to have the, uh, the reflected signals as well. Um, and so it's not going to get any gain, so you're going to be more close in with that. And so a Yagi is recommended for further out, but when you get close in and you start getting, uh, having trouble with, you know, selectivity, then a, a loop will kind of help you out. So that's kind of a multi-step tool. Um, but it gets so strong enough, again, you're going to need an attenuator on that. Um, so here's just some examples of some loops of arrow has a, a two meter and a 77 meter version they sell. You can build these. There's not a whole lot of, of parts to that. So something to, if you want to play around with it. But, um, it's just something that's out there. Um, so these uh, time difference of arrival sets, essentially it's a dual antenna thing. And it's basically saying the fox is over here. This antenna hears it before this antenna. And it can de uh, determine the distance or the, the, uh, it determines the time difference between you know here to here, and, and it's moving at the speed of light. So it's pretty amazing that they can calculate the difference between those. Um, and so it works with a lot of different antennas. Um, some have an integral uh, receiver in them, but um, you know there's a few options there. Um, vertical antennas, bow ties. I'll show you some of those. So you can still buy this handy finder for uh, thirty bucks uh, from this local club that still sells these on their website. And you kind of put the kit together. This is like a build your own on a perf board kind of thing. And then this is what they're selling. And it, you know, just a little thing that you turn and it gives you some directivity. Um, if you're maybe like a, a police force or radio shop and you, you know, you want to have sort of an idiot proof thing that you don't really have to think about too much, Vector Finder's making these devices and they have some different ones now with the digital readouts versus just LEDs. And uh, so you can buy something like that, and you fold out the antennas and tune them with the length. They're adjustable to get the right frequency. And I've never felt one of these, but you know they look kind of interesting. But I've never had a need. Um, so when you really get past some of that stuff, you really want to get into a directional antenna. And the idea being that uh, you get much more accurate bearings, uh, more sensitivity. Um, you get a better forward-to-back ratio, so you can kind of reach out and hear further away. Um, uh, these would fall into a quad or a Yagi antenna. Um, and so you point it in the horizon, you spin your body around to get the strongest signal. <clears throat> and uh, so I personally like um, when I was running uh, an offset attenuator setup um, to hunt the nulls. So it would be strong through this way, but it would be you know somewhere in here. But I'd get a hard null and a hard null. And so I would find those nulls and then know that it's ahead of me. And so when I'm hunting like that, I tended to like to listen for the nulls. And I see a lot of people doing this with their antenna. And it's like, no, you need to do big sweeps. Listen for those nulls. Um, so I always push people to that and the technique when they're looking. Um, so when the signal strength is greatest, you're pointing at the signal source. And so if you're looking at an S meter, um, 
If you have a real S meter, not like a Baofeng, then you can actually see the signal strength on the meter, but you may not be able to hear it with your ear. Um, and so that's sometimes helpful. Um, you know, you can take a big four element Yagi or quad off your car, you know, and, and try to carry it around, but it doesn't work very well if we've got it in the woods. So um, that's very cumbersome. Um, and that's usually really a lot of gain and a really sharp uh, knoll. And so you don't really need that if you're closer in and on foot. So like a three element Yagi works pretty well. Um, and then uh, I've even seen somebody build a UHF Yagi and hunt the third harmonic close in, and that worked well for them. So. But here's quads. These are kind of home-built uh, cubicle quad antennas. And so you see the uh, you know, different styles of those. Um, you know, they're more compact than the Yagi, and they're, um, you know, they're not going to poke your eye out with one of them, typically. They're, the antennas you know, can get a little pointy on the a Yagi. Um, you know, if you're going to mount it on your vehicle, a quad's better than a Yagi. It gets less in a, it, it's a closed antenna, so it has picks up less RF from your vehicle and different things. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've not played with one, but I've heard of people using them. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Here's a couple options if you want to buy one. Um, Cubix makes a few. Um, you can DIY a three element Yagi. This one's using, um, looks like aluminum, and I'm not sure what the elements are, maybe more aluminum. That looks almost like more of a, not a Yagi, more of a, uh, a log periodic maybe. I can't tell if those are insulated, but anyway, kind of that concept of three elements and, you know, feed it and off you go. Here's one where somebody made it a PVC and like welding rod. So that would be a way to do it. Um, the downside of these is that they can bend. You can pr pretty much bend something like that and then you got to deal with, you know, did it break it or can you bend it back? Here's one that they are using some sort of wire zip tied to a bunch of wooden sticks. So, you know, you don't have to spend a whole lot of money on something to make it work. Um, Arrow 2, I've got some people that hunt with these. Um, I don't have one, but I wanted one because um, in high winds, uh, the tape measure elements on this tends to fold over. And so that that's uh, kind of an interesting concept here. Um, and so the three element handheld is $114 right now. So. Not unreasonable, and it packs away. You can get them so they fold up, and you can get a case for them. So, and then you can also use it to work satellites if you want. That's what a lot of people have them already for satellite work, and then they just use them for fox hunts. Um, so this is sort of the gold standard of what everybody usually uses if they're starting from scratch. It's the tape measure Yagi by Joe uh, Lagio, and uh, this is a picture of my old one. Um, actually, that might be this one with a different connector on it so um, it's a favorite um, you know you can still find the original article here it's ta steel tape measure PVC pipe hose clamps uh, there's a wire hairpin match in there and uh, three elements is sort of the right compromise for most people um, it's really good foot to back ratio but it uh, it it, uh, it trades some gain for the deep knolls um, into the pattern in the rear, so it's um, it, it could have more gain, but then you lose other capabilities. Um, and it's great if you're going through the brush or you're crashing, you know, you're trying to throw it in the trunk and things, you know, doesn't quite fit, you know, because these things will fold up um, pretty easily. So, you know, if you hit it on track, it's, it's bouncing right back, and so it works pretty well. Um, my particular one here, I found a, a version of a tape measure at Menards that was extra thick. It's not a fat max because those are just getting wider, but they're not any thicker. So the chameleon or something. Yes. Like brand yep. Chameleon. The and so these are heavier duty, and so they f it fights the wind better. Is what I found. That's why I bought this one. Is that it holds up in the wind. If I put out my other one with the other style, like the Harbor Freight tape measures, then the wind is catching it. And so um, there's times where I have to actually hunt upside down because then the wind doesn't push it quite as hard as this. Yeah, that's pretty easy, but this is a lot more tougher. So sometimes I'll hunt it upside down depending on the wind direction. I think the fat maxes are as thick as those chameleons are about a third the price of a Stanley. Yeah. Most of the it's important for a fox hunt because if we're having a fox hunt, it has to rain. Yeah, it's, it's either rainy or windy. You know, the thought of it was nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, I'm always rainy. Yeah. So, um, it's all part of the experience. <laughs> yeah, so here's kind of the original drawing on this. Um, and so uh, it mentions in here to put a, like a choke right here behind the, uh, the ribbon. And 
and that's probably they've decided that's wrong and it's actually better to put the choke in the back mm -hmm. behind the reflector so some of the plans are still out of date for that if you see them around and it's got you know you can tell it here it's got a pretty good pattern on it um, so uh, that's why they, they put a choke in there to help pick up the off-axis bearings and uh, you know I put seven turns of coax around the boom that's this little uh, part right here all you got to do is just buy some extra coax and wrap it around there. Um, so everybody uses uh, hose clamps for theirs, and I at some point figured out that if I drilled out the stops on a T, then you can basically shove these little chunks of PVC pipe in there with the tape measure in there, and it locks them in. And so that's my my contribution to the the cause uh, to keep these locked in. And then it's pretty easy to just pull that out with a pair of pliers, and you can replace the elements when you when you ruin them. Because you will ruin them, um, inevitably. What I typically find is that it's folded up like this, and then somebody steps on it. Yeah. And so then you got to crease, and then it just, you're fighting it. So that's usually what do, does mine in. Um, uh, if you're starting to do this, you're going to have to tin these, typically, before you... So you've got to grind off the paint and tin them before you put them together. It makes it go a lot easier. Uh, apparently nobody's making kits anymore. You can just buy a full kit and put it together. I've looked, so uh, there's nothing on the internet. I'm doing a class in three weeks. I'll have your kit for you. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Right. Talk about that when he's done. Yep. Um, so we've done. Paul, Callie, and I have done workshops, um, and uh, basically to build this, we put a, a very detailed set of pictures and instructions on the web. You can go download this. And uh, the only thing we really don't, you know, that's not really covered in there is when the kit, we were doing the drilling out of the dead stops mm -hmm. for you before we got there and cutting some of the pieces. For, so it says, hey, there's a tape measure that's this long. Well, it's not cut if you don't have one of our kits. But you can figure it out pretty easily, right, Tim? I built right off of this exactly. Yes. Two of us did actually. This yes. thing, the SWR at 1.2, one right off yes. of this the first time we cut it up. So, I mean, it's, the lengths are perfect. I think it's easier, too, than the other one. Like, I think this is an easier build. Yeah. Than the hose clamps? Yeah, all that. I, yeah, I like yeah we, we did one. Brad did one with clamps and oh. on the outside. Yep. And I ran yeah. all my stuff on the inside. Like right. Those, and they performed exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. The, the design isn't changed. It's just the construction that the yep. really and what I changed. How, how much time you want to spend? Like you said, you got to hog some stocks out in the fittings. And that, right. That center connection, that center T. Yeah. Yep. You've got to feed your coax through, and you've got to kind of slide it out one side to do your hairpin on one side of the coax, and you've got to yep. feed it the other way. It's a little bit of a fight, yeah. but yeah. it worked. Yeah, if you want to look at this later, you can see there's a hairpin right here. And, you know, I can't take it apart because there's screws in it to hold it together right now. But, yeah, it's it's unique, and I talk about a technique to get it. You kind of have to roll this thing up and shove it in there and then unroll it. So, um, you know, there's some cool 3D printed pieces out there now you can find. People are doing some 3D stuff. Um, you know, ways to connect the, uh, the tape measure to the, the fittings and, you know, here we're screwing just to a boom. There's no T's in that. So kind of some neat stuff. Did your hairpin all exposed though to catch right. that stuff? Oh yeah, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I suppose you could put some heat shrink over it and kind of lock it on there, but... Tape it yeah. down or something. Yeah, I like that mine's enclosed. You're not going to hook it. Um, okay, attenuation. If you're not hunting with attenuation, it's way more difficult. Um, now, Melissa proves that it can be done, but I find it's a lot easier to have some sort of attenuation. The idea being, when you get close, there's too much signal, you're getting overwhelmed with it, you need to knock it down, and so that's where the attenuator comes in. Um, and so, um, you know, you can do other things to get attenuation. You can rotate it 90 degrees, and so hunt like this, even though you think it's vertically polarized. You get in the right range, you can do this, and you can tell the difference in the signal, and then you know how they've hidden the fox. It's got a vertical or horizontal polarized antenna. Um, so that's kind of something you can figure out on the fly. We typically almost always hunt vertically polarized. Uh, we are high to vertical. Um, and so, you know, you can tune off frequency again, third harmonics, uh, disconnect the antenna. Those are all things that still work with, this, with these types of things for, um, to get you that attenuation. Um, and so there's these passive attenuators. Here's some that are bionics to make some. Um, you can buy these little switch boxes at Hamfest sometimes. You can build them out of resistors. There's a lot of options to build an attenuator set. The idea being to knock your signal down um, so you can still get some directivity. Um, 
you know, here's a little box you can, you know, somebody was making. Um, so, unfortunately, when it starts going, the signal's so strong, it's going straight into the case, case leakage, this isn't going to work. So, um, one of our club members is always one of the first into the park. He's hunting with a seven meter, a seven element Yagi in the back of his van. And so he's always the first in the park and he's the last one to find it because he's trying to use an attenuator like this and he just can't get anywhere in there. It's just because he hasn't figured out that case leakage issue. So, yeah. Secret, don't tell him. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, the better way to deal with this is an offset attenuator. I thought I had it with me. I must have left it out in the truck because I set the radio on it so I didn't show it in the box. But. Um, if anybody really wants to sit, play with, with this, I've got it in the truck, and afterwards we can go out and I'll hook it up, and we can we can hunt in the parking lot if we want. Um, but it's uh, an offset attenuator is essentially it's got a crystal and it mixes the frequency. Typically, they're four megahertz crystals, and uh, um, you can tune the receiver to this off frequency. So we hunt on 146, you tune it to 150, and you know it, it works pretty well to do that. Um, so there's another kind of attenuator that's called active, so we call this offset, um, so that you kind of understand that you're not on the same frequency. Uh, and here's uh, you know, Joel Moe built the first one of these, and here's the schematic, and everything's sort of based off of this schematic right now that's out there. There's a lot of different versions. So um, here's, you know, here's a picture of me with my attenuator. I like to put it in a little conduit body, and then you put the knob on there, and so it works really well to have it one-handed turn the attenuation up and down with my thumb and then I'll have to have both hands on it because otherwise you're two-handed it so essentially it's it's right here and my thumbs there just and I'm just working that on it. yeah yeah P potentiometer yeah yep yep and so it works pretty well um, and so uh, you do have to have an HT hanging off because that's the radio still um, but that's how that works um, oh we got a video of it. I didn't realize the videos were live in here. First one's going to be my regular HT. We typically hunt on 14643, and so that's what I've got the radio tuned to. This is a 4 megahertz offset attenuator. It will shift the frequency that the fox is on up or down 4 megahertz. And so I typically listen on 150, 430. And then you could use the knob to put in or out attenuation as you need it. And so this lets you get uh, closer to the fox and still get your activity on the antenna. You don't get the saturation from uh, the frequency getting into the receiver through the case of the radio. And so if I uh, turn it up to 140, 150, 430, again, we're not hearing anything. The fox is off. So 146, 430, let's turn the fox on. And my so assistant help me. The tone that we hear from the fox. And so the attenuator doesn't do anything for me. And the radio is getting overloaded to the point that it's uh, yeah. going silent because there's so much signal this close to the box. If I turn it up to 150, 430, and the signal comes back, and I can turn the attenuation on. I'm rolling my thumb here. So, so you got to hear me you know, find the null on my left. So, closer and to roll the attenuation up to be able to tell that, that sounds better than that just like a lot of static here it's a little clearer and then that cuts out <clears throat> so that's how the offset attenuator works and I hunted for years and years with that um, and it worked pretty good Okay, um, so here's some different like build your own kits you can find out there or uh, that people have built, you know, just done off the schematic, buying the parts. Um, uh, let's see, oh, Joe Mole used to sell kits. I think he stopped, um, or no, he, uh, these, these are off of his designs. Uh, this one was by a guy named Marvin. I think he just went, kind of went out of business. I, I looked the other day and his website wasn't working. Um, there's still some other options out there. Um, so here's a picture of my my uh, offset attenuator in the conduit body. It works pretty well. 
Uh, I've burned through a number of 9-volt batteries, so I need a bit of a more robust on-off switch than even that one. Something a little harder to turn on, because I tend to throw it in a box and it gets bumped and turns on and mm. burns through the 9-volt. So, um, Arrow sells a version to go with their, their loop, um, and it's 60 bucks, and it doesn't even have a case. So um, that was like, oh, well, that's an option. Uh, Biotics has got one. It's a little cheaper, very similar. Um, is this what you have, Chris? Yeah. And the problem is, it's like impossible to put a case on it. Yeah. So. I call yeah. to fix it though. Did you end up changing up the top geometer? No, I don't have a good solution yet for how yeah. to get a case around the. I think if you did it right, you could 3D print like a shaft extension. And then last yeah. time I broke it. Yeah. And. Uh, um, the SMA connector had to be soldered back. Yeah. Right. So your better investment is probably buy a ten dollar kit. <laughs> these guys are selling these for ten bucks now, <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, pretty impressive. Fifteen assembled, uh, very similar to the others. And so I don't have one of these, but I stumbled. Somebody, I somebody was like, "Oh, I look what I found." Mine dropped last time and yeah. it pulled the solder points off. Yeah. So yeah so that's uh that's kind of probably where i would be looking to go in the future um they also sell and i've seen somebody with the version like this is what version seven so i've seen somebody with like a version six one of these little boxes that they sell as a little kit you can buy the assembler kit and it's still 31 dollars assemble and uh you know here's the nine volt battery on it and, you know i mean it seemed to work for them so this is probably where I'd be going right now if I needed to buy another one. And they even have an SMA or BNC options, so pretty sweet deal. Um, okay, so this version is, uh, this is my all-in-one device. This is what I've got right here now. And um, this is, you know, it's almost so easy it's cheating. <laughs> because it's just, it's, it's doing the auto attenuation for you. It's got a receiver. Um, this little Bluetooth transmitter, I plug in to here. And, uh, and turn off the speaker, and then I wear Bluetooth headphones so I can hear, and other people can't hear, so they can't. <laughs> There's no competition. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that works pretty well for me. Um, so it's kind of picking up nothing. It's sort of, you know, it, it, it doesn't like the TV, right? But it's still, at, you know, it's level one, and so there's not a whole lot there. Turn the fox on. a little better, the antenna's not bent over halfway. If I get closer, it jumped to an 8. And so now, now it's 7. And so you kind of look at the screen and you're like, oh god, I'm at, I'm at a 6. I've got to be within yards of it. And so, yeah, that's... That's the sniffer. So, yeah, it, it takes a lot of the effort out of it because you can then not have to look at the S meter. You're here in the S meter with the way that's set up. There's some other modes in it. Um, you know, and you can hunt uh, ELTs with it on 120 something for, for uh, megahertz, 121, or you can hunt on the two meter handball. The fox back off. That's the beauty of the. Uh, of having that thing on uh, with the DTMF is you can just turn it on and off remotely. So um, you don't need to see my demo, but okay. So this is yep. So um, uh, this is some Dopplers. So the idea being that if you've got like four antennas and you're figuring out which antenna is getting the signal first, and and uh, if you've ever heard a train go by and it's blowing the whistle. It sounds differently on the pitch coming at you than when it passes you. And it's that same concept of the sound waves are coming at a different speed. And, and so that's kind of the theory behind some of these. And so you can kind of build some different arrays to put these out. 
Um, there's some designs out there to build kits. See, that TDOA is kind of working on that same concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I don't tend to know the science behind it, but I know that it's a thing, right? Um, I actually bought an eBay Ramsey Doppler kit that doesn't made anymore. I haven't put it together yet, but it's, I think I found it on eBay once and it does still need to be built. They still sell these Pico Dop kits for 169 bucks. A um, little, uh, little similar to the, what this thing is. Um, these guys are more in the professional space, so for 400 bucks you can buy a kit from them. And uh, it does a very similar thing. Um, you can get an app on your uh, laptop, you know, and it'll like plot out where you need to go to find the signal. Um, so a few years ago, um, they uh, put out a Kickstarter, uh, RTL-SDR, the si uh, software defined receiver, stuck four of them in a case mm -hmm. and basically put out some software and uh, a shielded metal enclosure and I paid 250 <coughs> bucks for this thing and that's what's sitting on the table back here is uh, that setup. And so um, there's a battery I use. Um, the first thing is a power supply to dump a whole bunch of amps at, at five volts for the USB. You have to power both of those USB. There's a tinker board, the little single board computer. And then the little metal case on the right is the actual Kerberos with the four receivers in it. And so you have to calibrate it and time sync it to uh, a, its own noise source. And then you put the, um, the antennas on and uh, turn off the noise source and put the antennas on a vehicle. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in a second here. So this is actually me screwing around last night. The Fox is at my house, not real high, um, so I wasn't really getting much distance. but. I started out driving down Lincoln Highway here, and uh, when I went past my neighborhood, you can kind of see that the blue is the coldest, the green is the middle, and then the red was the strongest signal. I just one pass down the street there. It already said, hey, here's the green circle where we think it is, here's the level of confidence circle. You know, what, you know, just me driving down the street, it already picked up that. It put a red square in where it thinks it was. Um, Let's see, so then I kind of looped around and came up from the south, and it's obviously getting a little more accurate. The blue lines are the bearings it's taken. Um, and uh, went up and turned around and came back, and so I'm starting to get some more confidence. The, the circle has shifted south here. Um, and then it, uh, it went down my street, and the red lines, the red dots disappeared because these are now the strong ones, the ones right when I drove right past the thing. Um, and so, then I pulled in the driveway, and you can see I got a bunch of strong signals um, because it knew it was right there. So this is what it looks like, kind of just, just the dots. And then this is kind of the other setting. You can just have it like give you the heat map of, uh, of which grid's this big, the hottest, and uh, the confidence circle in green. So that's all off my old uh, Samsung cell phone connected um, Wi-Fi to that device. So it's kind of neat. Um, so. Really, really finicky to set that up with the app that they sent you. Um, there's a lot of like, there's like 25 steps to get it set up. So it takes me about, I can do it after I practice, I can do it in 10 minutes. So that's just turning the thing on to where I'm ready to hunt. It takes me 10 minutes because you gotta like, you know, turn on and off the, the noise source and sync things up and set the gain on the antennas. It's kind of finicky. Um, so. That was their Kickstarter. They don't sell those because now they sell the Kraken. They put a fifth receiver in, much cleaner app, I've been told. The noise source and all of that is all automatic in there and the switching, so you don't have to mess with putting the, the, uh, the little dummy loads on and doing the testing that I have to do. It's also 500 bucks. So they're proud of these. They actually buy them through Mauser if you want to buy one. That's where you said buy it from. And then they sell you two, uh, 200 bucks for these five antennas. So you're going to drop some cash if you want to do this. I think they're more after like a commercial market than a ham here. Do you know what the frequency range is that'll do? Uh, pretty wide. Pretty wide, yeah. It's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Like it'll do HF to, to you know, gigahertz stuff. It's just in how much room do you have for your array. I wouldn't want to try to go mobile and chase HF because you really oh, aren't yeah. going to get, get it to work right. Um, and trying to do, with my mag mount antennas, trying to do gigahertz, the, the antenna spacing is really hard to get to. Because uh, you really can't space, you have to be less than a half wavelength apart okay. on the antennas. And so it gets really hard to physically put them all together. So there's sort of some physical limits there. But you kind of see here's the kind of the chain of antennas, device, a single board computer, 
interface to uh, you know a PC or Android, uh, and then you can run their interface on that. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of how that works. So I ended up putting these five antennas or four antennas on my roof. Um, uh, I took like a, a weird tape measure that had zero centers and screwed them together and so then everyone is at 19 inches for my spacing and so that's I lay this cross on my roof and drop all four antennas at 19 inches and pull the cross off and I'm ready to hunt so that works pretty well um, so I've not really fox hunted with it it was just kind of this toy it's like oh that's interesting so I bought it and you know, I can tell you exactly where the National Weather Service transmitter is just by driving down the highway. I mean, I tested it, it worked. It was like dead accurate. Um, so, uh, some extra stuff. Um, I like to carry a compass, um, but the bearings are off. If you ever get into it, you start realizing, hey, the bearings are backwards and that you're chasing the needle if you, unless you turn the knob. And so what I ended up doing was printing this little circle thing I found somewhere uh, out of like on a transparency. Um, you know, overhead projector. Everybody probably knows here what that is. Our kids don't know what the heck that is. But printing this thing and cutting it out and sticking it on there, and it's over here on the table. And so that way you just turn it and it points, the needle points to the bearing instead of having to turn the knob and all that. So uh, this is just like an 8.5 by 11 sheet that you can lay over a map and get a bearing. So if you say, oh, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's 90 degrees, and then you lay this on the map north up and look at 90 degrees you can kind of tell where on your map that is and then you can take your marker and draw a line so that's just what this guy does um, i find it's helpful to have a clock or a timer so i usually use wear a stopwatch around my neck and every you know it's on a three minute cycle one minute on two minutes off i like the stopwatch some people started buying these interval timers for workouts and programming it up to the settings and then it beeps at you and it says hey 10 minute 10 seconds to go and it warns you that it's coming even you know, it might say, okay, get ready, you know, okay, now, you know, work hard, <laughs> but, you know, you get the concept, right? <laughs> yeah. 20 bucks. Yeah, I've got, I've got, like, an app on my phone that does the same thing, an interval timer, and, you know, you can change it instead of having it say, okay, you know, push it, push it! <laughs> Turn that crap off. <laughs> but, yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, okay, so here's another hunt, and kind of to talk about the techniques that, that why they're important. So, started in Central Ames again, got a reading up here, okay, well... I headed for it and I mistakenly drove down the same line essentially and ended up on the same line. So I'm like, okay, it's somewhere in here, right? Could be out on the interstate, could be on Dayton, don't know. So I think it, that's where the lines cross, right? <clears throat> Initially, so I'm like, oh, I gotta go way out there. So I start back here at this little park and I get across the bearing over there. I was way off because I didn't get a crossing bearing on that and so it ended up it was actually right there so that just demonstrated to me that I assumed one thing but I chased it to there um, another thing that I always tell people that it's hard for them to understand is always say follow the signal they're thinking in their head there's a park here and a park here and a park here it's got to be one of those three parks and we always tell people it's on publicly accessible land I like to hide them in cul-de-sacs at a dead end street. There's no park around, but it's publicly accessible, so I'll stick it in this hole to set. Right, Chris? Yep, we found it. Yep. And I'd never been there in town. I had it never was, been there until I went looking for a place to hide it. It was, it was like it was, really it was, obscure. Yeah. I got yeah. a house down there, though, because I didn't know yeah. that was there. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, You'd lock your box and chain it up? Or? Uh, depends. I mean, like in that case, I saw some neighbors and I said, hey, I'm dropping this thing. And they're like, oh, okay. Um, if it's a city park, I tend to put a bike cable around it, a padlock. And it says, you know, it's got my phone number and it says what it is. So. Um, okay, so if you're going to do a hunt, these are the things you need to talk through. Are you going to do first to find or do California style where they record everybody's mileage? Before you start, they take a picture of your odometer <laughs> and they record it at the end. So you've got four hours to drive the shortest distance. Right? And that's how they judge you. Um, are you going to do vertical horizontal polarization? Are you going to do a night hunt? We've never done a night hunt, but I was kind of intrigued by that. That would be tough. Night on the timber. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, looking for snipes. Um, so what's the timing? Uh, we typically had been a four-minute cycle, one on, three off. Um, we had some people who were like, it's a little tough, so let's do a three-minute cycle, one on, two off. That's what we've been doing. Uh, this fall, we went up to uh, Waterloo. 
and they had four transmitters going at George Wythe State Park. One of them was a 15 second on, five minute off cycle. Oh, no. That That's was nuts. a challenge. It, it was, I found it, but it was a challenge. Because yeah. you're just doing a lot of like, okay, another three minutes to stand here, take a bearing, you know. So it was just all your overall time on that. Oh, we ended up hunting, they re-hid two of them tw oh, again. The first two got re-hid with a lot tougher, and so we ended up spending like four hours doing all six. You just run around to work with. Yeah, it was a good time. So our next hunt, we hit two then. We had one that was the normal and one that was a lot tougher. And it was tougher. And it was camouflaged, right, Ben? I think I stepped on it three times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Chris, I'm like, it has to be right here. And yeah. I look down and I finally see the antenna. We weren't even hunting with the antenna at that point. We were just right. trying to find. Yeah, yeah. And they thought it would be easy to find. Now I buried it in leaves. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think I stepped on it three times. Hit one under a bridge. Uh, or is that somebody else? No, Chuck um, uh What is Chuck's call? Anyway, he he hit it under. Cedar uh, Valley or somewhere that did that. Uh, well, no, he hit one at Brookside Park on the uh, on the um, Sixth Avenue Bridge. It was under the, but it was real close to where we started. Okay. So everybody was getting a strong signal, but then they were just fighting it because of all the reflections. There. Yeah. Yeah, and then you get on the wrong side of the train tracks because they're elevated. Yeah. And then you like lose the signal as soon as you go under the train tracks, and you're like, where'd it go? And yeah, it was a tough one. Yeah, that that fox on that I tagged along with, I did a video on that, and it was like trying to po point cameras without giving locations away. So yeah, because you gotta be conscious of people around you are still hunting. There's like eight of them. So you kind of yeah. kind of find it, and you're like, oh, there it is. And so like do this, and you kind of walk over, you know, and you kind of wander off because you don't want to like. I found it! It's right there! So I had, like, I had this camera going. Chris and I are talking. I'm pointing the camera at it. And then in post-editing, I'm circling where it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. so there's some technique to kind of let other people have their hunt, too. Or the uh, free one. The, do you get in the six? No, Paul hit that one. Yeah. That I've, I've, there's a rope on it because that's what I use to tie on and then put it 30 feet in the tree. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that before. Yeah. And they're just running around like, where is it? And it's, it's up there. So yeah, yeah, I have fun with it. Um, yeah, so then you got an idea. I already had ideas. I thought I had nasty ideas. Oh, <laughs> it's just up in my game. We we thought about putting on a side ride bus and like driving around. <laughs> um, you know, just just bribe the driver to let let us put it in the back of the bus, kind of thing. That would be hilarious. Um, uh, so much for triangulation. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, you know. And so you gotta. You know. I've heard of people pointing at a water tower with a beam, so then it's reflecting off the water tower. <laughs> I've heard stories of somebody put it on a turntable, like a record player, you know, and it was like, it had a directional antenna. I mean, I've never seen these things, I'm not, not that mean. I think that a 50 watt hunt would just be oh the most God. difficult thing to do. Hunting one watt is tough. Um, and so, you know, then you gotta talk about antennas. Right? Are you going to use uh, uh, just the rubber duck? Um, I've also got a uh, like a roll up. Um, it's a sleeve dipole that we use, and so we can hang that higher. So one time the, the fox is under a bush, but the antenna was 15 feet in the air on a light pole. I put it on the fiberglass fishing pole, taped it on there, and stuck it against this light pole that you know in a parking lot at Fairway. So they you know they were getting a strong signal from way far away, and so everybody kept stopping on the way, thinking it's got to be right here. It's really strong. And they weren't getting bearings, crossing bearings to say, no, it's not in front of me, it's way off. You know, they just kept getting strong bearings, so they just kept incrementally inching towards it. So, you know, I do stuff like that, try to help them learn techniques on how I hide. Um, so now you're going to do a shotgun start, or you're going to all start in one place. We tend to like the one place thing, mm -hmm. a little more fair. Um, and then you can allow teams. Uh, we tend to do hints after the first hour. so. You know, how, however you want to do that, and then you know, just have fun with it. Come up with crazy ideas. Here's some resources. So uh, this presentation's on uh, my website, storyaries.org. You can click on the downloads, and it's there. Uh, I loaded it last night. Um, KB7VML.net is uh, where you can go get the uh, the fox hunt building, or the, the tape measure building instructions. And then homing in has a lot of classic articles. There's not that much new other than some equipment. So good techniques on there. Um, you can buy a book from Joel Mole. Um, and we happen to have a fox hunt tomorrow if anybody's really itching to get out. Um, we've got one scheduled names. 
So uh, we're going to do the two fluxes again. So the primary one's on 146.43. It'll be that box there. And then Paul's got his going. He's hiding, Paul Cowley. And uh, his is in a metal ammo can about that size. Um, and so that one will be, again, I think a little more difficult of the challenge factor. I'm not going to make it up tomorrow, but <laughs> I'll be listening to your guys' repeater to hear how yeah. it's going. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's it. Nice job. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one thing I didn't mention that I realized that this morning I probably should have put in here is if you want to do a mapping app, there's a thing called Sig Tracks. It's an app you can get on your phone and you can draw lines on it. It's like seven bucks. I can't remember how much it costs. Yeah. So that's something that I probably should throw in here is a, if you want to get an app and draw, you know, have it draw those lines. That works 